Nuclear is a part of Canada's story, and the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, or the NWMO, is a key element of the nuclear fuel cycle. It's a story that begins in Saskatchewan, where the extraction of uranium helps power nuclear plants in Canada and others around the world. And it's a story that ends with us, the NWMO, the organization tasked by the Government of Canada with the safe, long-term management of our country's used nuclear fuel. It's an incredibly important responsibility, and we answer to Canadians. We need to deal with used fuel for the long term, for generations and generations to come in a way that is safe for all of us. Everyone at the NWMO is proud of the work that we're doing. We're scientists, engineers, and safety assessment specialists. And we're your neighbor. We're driven to protect the environment, people, and this beautiful land. Today, I'm Paul Schopen, and also a board member of OGRA. Scott's career has been a deliberate and methodical immersion into the world of building better communities. His experience have touched on immigration, labor markets, agri-food, corporate responsibility, transportation, public finance, infrastructure, governance, and correctional services. On August 1st, 2020, Scott became the 10th Executive Director in the 127-year history of the Ontario Good Roads Association, one of Canada's oldest and largest municipal organizations. Through training, advocacy and research, Scott leads a team that has focused on everything roads since 1894. Prior to this, Scott served as OGRA's government relations lead for 10 years. Scott lives in Guelph with his family. He is a graduate of the University of Guelph, the Linolian University in Krakow, Poland, and the Detroit music scene. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Scott Butler. I am the executive director here at the Ontario Good Roads Association. Uh, it's my distinct privilege to be here uh, representing the organization today on behalf of the staff, as well as the 15 board of directors uh, from across Ontario, including Paul Shopman, who also sits on the Phenom board of directors. Um, I believe as first vice president, first vice president, but also um, coincidentally, he happens to be first vice president of OGRA. So, um, this is a great opportunity for us at what is really a pivotal and exciting time for the organization uh, to begin begin talking and conversing with our members, including those uh, municipalities in northeastern Ontario, um, with an eye towards towards figuring out the best way we can prepare for a post COVID world. Now, I will promise you, I will keep COVID references at a minimum. I want to be much more forward looking than that. Um, as I remind people, uh, COVID had to start, it's going to have a finish and we need to be prepared for returning to that normal um, as soon as possible. So without any further ado, I'm going to share my screen here. Let's see if I'm able to figure this out. There we go. Um, and pull up a presentation. So before I begin, I would like to thank uh, President Danny Whalen and Executive Director Mac Bain for the opportunity for me to be here and address you today. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, the generosity and the effort that the City of Timmins has uh, put forth in putting together this event, uh, working with Phenom staff to, to put forward what's really a comprehensive uh, and, and thought-provoking event. Um, City of Timmins has long been uh, heavily involved in, in the Good Roads uh, Association. And, uh, you know, we're happy to, we're happy for the invitation to be here. Once again, collaborate with them. So a little bit about OGRA, a very brief history. 
social justice movement in the 1870s, beginning in Rhode Island in the United States. Um, in effect, what does it become? It becomes an organization that is an alliance between the modern day Toronto Cycling Union and the Ontario Federation of Agriculture. So we have uh, wheelmen, as they were called at the time, cycling advocates, and, and the agriculture community coming together to advocate for better connectivity through better road build, better road construction, better road uh, design. Um, the benefits were obvious then. Um, the reality is not a heck of a lot has changed. So if we look, a very quick journey from 1894 when OGRA came into being to what I will call tomorrow, even though that, uh, that image there that is supposed to represent tomorrow is in fact two years old. On the left, we have a, a picture taken about 1921, we believe, of Golden Avenue in South Porcupine. And what you see represented there is fairly typical of what Northern Ontario experienced in the early part of the 20th century. Frontier communities all through your region began to demand roads that were similar to what were being constructed in the southern part of the province. On the right, we have something that was put forward by a design firm in the Netherlands, Dan Rosgaard. Um, what they have there is a road that is actually under construction, a, a test uh, sample is under construction currently in, in the Netherlands. Um, and it uses a whole series of technologies that were clearly unavailable uh, back in 1921 when those folks in South Porcupine were designing uh, Golden Avenue. It has photovoltaic charging lanes, it has micro wind turbines, bioluminescent paint markings, all these sorts of new cutting edge technologies. And the, the disparity or the discrepancy we see, see between 1921 on the left and 2019 on the right is being experienced everywhere in the world, and it's especially being experienced here in Ontario. Um, there's, there's a lot of change happening in the sector, and municipalities are at the forefront of this change. So they're changing, so is Good Roads. Um, we're in the process of going through a massive uh, overhaul and reimagining of what we uh, can be as an organization, how we might be best positioned to actually help you accomplish your work as municipalities and as First Nations, uh, both of which are members of, of the association. You're going to see a lot of this look on the, on the left in the coming days, months, and years. Um, sneak preview. More broadly, if we go back to that previous slide where we saw this discrep uh, the discrepancy between 1921 and 2019, so in effect, one century of time. And what we see are a whole series captured in those two images are a whole series of underlying challenges that are emerging across the sector. Um, it's really incumbent if municipalities and First Nations are to, to realize the full benefit of the opportunity that's being presented to them by, uh, by this change that organizations like OGRA, that organizations like AMO, like Roma, like FNOM, NOMA, all the usual suspects are prepared to both understand, but more importantly, take these changes and figure out ways that can advance your interests as municipalities. And doing this requires understanding what these emergent challenges are and how they're being reflected in communities across Ontario. And what we know based on the work we've been doing in the last year is that many of the outcomes uh, that these challenges and that these changes are imposing on the sector are likely to have an even more pronounced effect in Northern Ontario communities. So what's going on? There are two big forces, if you will, that are, I think, fundamentally disrupting every aspect of transportation, infrastructure, and municipal governance. And the first is a technological revolution. Again, I'll go back to that slide. I'll make quick reference to it. We saw a corduroy road versus a photovoltaic road. The, the, the difference between those two could not be more stark. That's happening everywhere. Every community is feeling these pressures. Um, we also know that constituents are especially tuned into this. We're, we're more tech aware than we've ever been before. And there's an expectation that technology is uh, ready to to solve all of these most pressing problems. Um, and it's important for municipalities to figure out ways to uh, 
be prudent uh, in terms of their investments in this realm, and at the same time, be prepared to to get outside their comfort zone in order to capitalize on some of this change that's happening within the technological sphere. The other one that's really important, and I think is goes hand in hand with with the technological disruption, is this idea of digitization or big data. The transportation and infrastructure sectors are rife with this. And while I think it's obviously understood or intended to be a positive change, we realize that there's in fact disruption that's unintended or negative in, in the consequence. We saw what happened recently with the pipeline in the Southeast of the United States, direct result of, of digitizing what would previously been a analog technology. So there's four factors I quickly want to touch on that I think are really important. And they are what we look at at Good Roads as having the most profound impact on, on the sector uh, and on how you're able to go about doing your work. And the first one is this idea of trust decay. So what is trust decay? In effect, it's the, the blurring of facts and interpretation with facts and data and disagreements over this. It's the, the blurring of opinion and fact. It is the increase in relative volume of people who may have disregards for facts. And what the outcome is, is lower, uh, a lower sense of trust across society. This is an example from London, uh, here in Ontario, former board member at OGRA was during the campaign had a candidate who actually ended up winning uh, go out and purchase attack ads uh, attacking the board member and the description was anonymous website. Um, we see this happening time and time again in pretty much every sphere of public life. Uh, when it comes to transportation issues, when it comes to infrastructure issues, you're engaging the public through very obvious ways, um, whether it's public consultation, all the all the usual means by which the public uh, finds out and is um, engaged when when in projects like this take place. What we're finding is people are coming with very low opinions, and it's not just it's not just um, the political realm. It, it's spilling across everything. The Edelman. Edelman's a, a big public relations firm and they do a trust barometer. And every year they ask Canadians who they feel are credible voices within, within the public realm. Uh, when I say this public realm, I mean broadly media, things like that. Um, what they found out is that trust decay is actually converted into full on information bankruptcy. That was the conclusion of 2021. And you can see across there, a majority of people, a majority of Canadians find each one of these categories of people to be untrustworthy. Strangely, in the last year, between 2020 and 2021, government officials were the only group that was measured that actually increased in volume. And when I think about FNOM, or if I think about AIM or OGRA, I, I think about who, who when, when someone with those, with those organizations or with those associations speaks, what are they perceived as? And they're perceived as those blue bars, they're government officials, they're NGO representatives, and they're members of boards of directors. And to a T, what we're seeing is a large plurality of Canadians don't find people credible. And this really complicates the work that we're trying to do and you're trying to do as municipalities. The other factor, what the next factor that's really influencing things is in a fundamental way is climate change. Um, independent of whether or not uh, you agree or disagree with the science behind it, climate change is having real world consequences on our communities. Um, the, the image on the left there is from uh, <sighs> Kasheshawan and Fort Albany First Nation, which has experienced up in, in the Phnom region significant flooding um, in the last number of years. And when OGRA steps back and looks at what we're responsible for and what municipalities look to, to us to help them with, we see two things in the forecast that, that pose um, some real concern for us. The first is the length of the frost-free seasons is set to increase across Ontario by average of 43%. This has significant implications for municipal uh, winter maintenance activities. 
It's also significant implications for the agriculture sector and the forestry sector, both of which are growing concerns in, in your part of the world. Um, at the same time, we're also seeing the freeze thaw cycles declining by six point, or sorry, by seven to eight cycles per year. So this means we'll be crossing that zero degree centigrade threshold eight fewer times on average in the coming years. And again, immense, immense implications for uh, winter maintenance activities and the use of road salt, particularly in southern Ontario. The third factor I want to talk about, what we really are plugging into is economic uncertainty. There has been uh, no shortage of this, the 2008 financial crisis, the European debt crisis, uh, commodity volatility, uh, the pandemic, again, sorry for the COVID reference. Um, all those things are beyond the control of any one government, and they are certainly beyond the control of municipal governments. At the same time, uh, we have a neighbor that is very large and um, has an outsized sense of uh, influence over how, how things go here in Ontario. And the policy direction in the United States over the last, say, three presidential cycles has been erratic. It's been all over the place. And what this does is it feel it fosters a sense of uncertainty and it makes it easy for us to kick cans down the road. So that is not what we want to happen. We need uh, some clear direction and collaboration between all three orders of government in Canada if we're actually to make some headway here. Strangely enough, the, the, the World Economic Forum publishes a thing called the World Uncertainty Index. Um, and you can see there, it measures basically, looks at the media and measures um, the sentiment of stories published about the economy. Uh, prior to, uh, so if I go here and look at the prior to uh, the onset of the pandemic, we were already at a period of heightened uh, economic uncertainty. And that dipped a bit in the last half of 2019 and then spiked into 2020. Now, strangely enough, what happened coming out of the, the middle of the year, people began to feel more confident about the economy. And we went back to a footing um, as a society that was more, more in line with what we were experiencing two or three years after the Great Recession or um, in the late 90s in the lead up to a relatively um, placid economic period prior to the dot-com dot bubble. Um, oh, I'm just going to go back. Uh, that is worth keeping an eye on um, because uh, I'm not sure there's there seems to be a great deal of debate about how sustainable the current fiscal arrangement is between the three orders of government. The the final thing I want to talk about when when we sit down as staff and begin thinking through what's going to be influencing our work in the coming years is this idea of a paradigm shift. So how infrastructure is defined and how it's cared for is changing rapidly. Um, if you're the Ontario Good Roads Association and you see a proposal like this one on the left, uh, which is being touted for Innisfil, uh, it's a development of 100,000 people, roughly just a bit more than 100,000 people. And this is supposed to be the main entryway into this development. Uh, if you're the Good Roads Association, the first thing that jumps out is there are no roads here. We have rail lines and we have connected uh, active transportation paths. We need to be plugged into this change that's happening. And the change that's happening is twofold. On the one hand, I think there's a social reconsideration of infrastructure. It started really the first real clear example was the heat wave uh, in Chicago in the mid nineties. A lot of study took place and they found that these assets, community assets like libraries, community centers had the greatest determination on whether or not a community fared well or didn't fare well during that heat wave. We've seen again more recently and again, apologies for the incoming COVID reference. Um, Long-term health care has been a critical determinant in how well communities have fared. The quality of long-term health care has been a determinant in how well communities have fared during the COVID crisis. And increasingly, we're beginning to think about this sort of traditional soft infrastructure as being more rigid or more hard. At the same time, that the other real paradigm shift that's taking place is this debate. On the one hand, we have the on the left the debate over what infrastructure is. Um, seems to be seeding way to an idea of the effects, the social outcomes associated with infrastructure decisions. 
Uh, that crosscut article is looking at um, the, the decisions or the outcomes associated with highway development in the Northwest of the United States. Whether or not you agree with these assertions is really immaterial. And OGRA isn't here to say one or the other is, you know, that one is right and one is wrong. What we're here to say is this is happening and you as a municipality, you as a road authority, you as a municipal association need to understand that it's happening. And we, we sit here ready to help you figure out the best way to navigate this because we know for a fact that these conversations are already starting to take place in Ontario and we need to be ahead of them. Quickly, if we look at this, there's no doubt in our minds here that climate change is the biggest opportunity and the biggest risk if you look at this analysis, but all of them are, are fairly significant. And there's, you know, the optimist in me says we're, we're, out, we're way towards strength and opportunity. This means in effect, we can do this. We can, we can address these questions in ways that will work for the public. The question is, what can OGRA do? Well, we can provide you with some road forward thinking that elevates and educates and engages you as our members. How do we do that? It's really the question. Training is obviously top of mind. We're looking at localizing training. We recently opened up an Eastern Road School. We know a Northern Road School would work and we're intent on examining how we can make that, we can bring that to fruition. We need to begin looking at climate change. Are our standards specific enough? Are they, are they adequate for what we're seeing in terms of weather patterns now? Asset management, uh, we advocated along with other associations for an extension of the asset management planning regulation schedules. Happy to have had that. At the same time, the urgency behind effective asset management is, remains, regardless of what the schedule is. We're committed to helping you find the best way to manage those assets to manage your roads, your bridges, your culverts. Um, and we're fortunate to have a lot of expertise on staff prepared and ready to help out on that front. We're also looking at modernizing our course delivery. The COVID made us go online and we realized we were able to reach folks up in your neck of the woods who might have been prevented from uh, participating previously. We wanna make sure we don't lose that. We'd still like to be able to uh, provide them with an opportunity to be involved. It's really important to us. Member services. Again, I'm going to come back to the asset management thing. We are the ben beneficiaries of having some extraordinarily smart people who are gaining recognition uh, within Ontario, within Canada, and globally for the intelligence and the knowledge they have in the asset management space. We want to we want to flesh this out more. Uh, we want to continue fleshing out to, as well our relationship back to post secondary institutions. Um, if there are initiatives or ideas in your communities that uh, you're interested in, in examining in a more critical scientific lens, please reach out to us. We're, we're more than prepared to help with this. We also want to look at our communications channels. We know that we have an opportunity to be uh, to connect communities, to connect staff within those communities to one another and connect you to the private sector and the private sector to you. Um, please let us know how we can help do that. The next thing is advocacy. And again, you see some overlap to what I talked about earlier, uh, climate change. Um, we need to be thinking about the effects of climate change. We're already seeing discussions around uh, new standards. New standards are being entertained potentially for concrete and less carbon intensive or decarbonized uh, transportation methods. We're trying uh, to get up to speed on that and understand what the implications are and defend and advance your interest as municipalities. Quality of life analysis. I mentioned 1870, uh, farmers and cyclists get together. Not much has really changed during that time. We're right back at that starting point where it is understood that uh, having an effective transportation system um, leads to direct bump in quality of life. And so we're trying to make sense of how we can help you capture that information and at the same time uh, make the decisions when it comes to uh, selecting materials or when it comes to putting together effective tenders or whatever the case may be that will realize those outcomes. Well, 
going hand in hand with that is prosperity analysis. We need to understand the business of this sector uh, as municipalities. And frankly, we need to uh, help businesses understand the municipal consideration because for too long, I think it's been a one-way conversation or a one-way street, if you know, we're gonna use the analogy. And I mentioned earlier, the equity, diversity and inclusion. There are impacts that all of these decisions have on communities. We need to better understand what those are. I mentioned earlier, uh, sneak peek. So we're in the midst of this larger rebrand. I think you can expect to see a lot of this look and feel in the coming days. Again, I want to thank uh, I want to thank Phenom for this opportunity. My contact information is there, and I would ask any of you who um, have any interest, please reach out at your convenience. We're happy to discuss how we can help. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Miller Waste is a multidisciplinary waste management organization. We're a diversion company, not a landfill company. And I think that's a, that's a really strong point to be made. We focus on recycling and also on diverting other waste streams from landfill. Our company can be defined into four basic services. One is collection, waste collection. We also process waste. We process organics. We process recyclables. We design and build uh, large integrated waste management facilities. So these are large facilities that would take recycling products and divert them. We're committed to the sustainability of this business to make sure that this business continues to have a life long, long after us.